Hey everybody, my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We train and certify home inspectors all over the world. And we also do webinars. And this is a free, live, online, interactive webinar. And um, sometimes I do the presentations. Those are the boring ones. If you can't sleep at night, you can do my classes. But sometimes the good ones are when we have a, an expert instructor. And today we do have that expert instructor. And his name is Eric Ross. Um, we're going to do a webinar. And during this webinar, you can ask questions if you'd like. But um, it's going to be a two-hour webinar. We've got a lot to go over. We're going to take a break in the middle of the two-hour webinar. But feel free to ask questions on your side. There should be a Q&A button. Um, there's also a chat button. I'm not going to pay attention too much to the chat. Do the Q&A. I kind of like that because you can upvote good questions. And um, I might interrupt Eric if that's OK. Uh, with a good question. Um, maybe we'll save some at the end, but we've got a lot to, to go over. So let's get started. In this webinar, you're going to learn about HVAC systems and components, um, including gas furnaces, their categories, air conditioning systems, the heating and cooling cycles, characteristics of energy efficiencies, and a lot more. Um, again, to our webinar, if you're an InterNet member, at the end of the live webinar, for attending the live webinar, you can upload two hours of CE into your dashboard. Now, Eric Robs has more than 20 years of experience in the area of HVAC as the owner and operator of his own company and as a field tech for industrial and commercial systems and as an instructional, uh, instructional designer for train and as a trainer, instructor, and sales rep for various companies. He has a graduate, he's a graduate of the community college of the Air Force. He holds two associate's degrees in mechanical and electrical technology and in military instructional technology, as well as an EPA 608 universal certification. Holy cow, Eric, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I looked up uh, 608. Um, those are for people who, that certification is a federal certification for folks who handle um, refrigerants and systems that could release refrigerants into the air. Isn't that right? Yes, it is, Ben. Wow, you've got the credentials like crazy, my man. So thank you so much, sir, for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're coming from kind of like an overlapping industry. Home inspectors, we, we inspect these systems and components and you, uh, well, you know all about them. And we really appreciate having a, an expert instructor come to our site and teach us more about these systems and components. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric. Yes, absolutely, Ben. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Absolutely. And we'll get into our PowerPoint presentation. Yep. And while you're bringing that up, again, folks, if you're attending live, feel free to ask Eric some questions that you have. Use the Q&A feature if you'd like. And uh, take it away, Eric. All right, perfect. Um, thank you, Ben. And as been mentioned, uh, so here's kind of a slide of a few of my credentials. Uh, started out in the HVAC industry within the Air Force and got all my uh, credentials and then was sought after by many uh, different manufacturers within the HVAC industry to include Train, Reem Rude, and uh, now I'm a technical trainer for Linux um, and still serving in the United States Air Force. So, this is kind of my background. And what we'll do is kind of talk about what we're gonna get into today. Some of the hot topics uh, that I put together for you guys, uh, heating types and their categories. We're gonna talk about venting on natural gas appliances, furnace sequence of operation, AC and heat pump systems and AC sequence of operation. The more you guys know about how a system actually operates, um, it, it makes it a lot easier to understand if, if there actually is a problem when you guys are out there doing home inspections. So a couple of the objectives that I've kind of laid out for you guys, um, explaining by the end of this, you should be able to explain the sequence of operation um, on furnaces, uh, identify different categories of gas furnaces and describe AC and heat pump operations. <clears throat> So we'll get into the heating types and categories. Um, first part of this is you have three different main types of heating uh, appliances out there that you guys are going to be inspecting. Uh, you always have you have the electric heat, 
you have a gas heat and you have an oil fired uh, heating system typically. Um, and here's kind of a diagram of just a cutout of all the bells and whistles within a uh, furnace system, just kind of showing you locations of different components uh, within within that system and how the air comes in and how the air is conditioned and then supplied out to the home. So a few things that we definitely wanted to point out, especially as home inspectors, is inspect when you're doing your inspections you're going to have main four main components that you're going to be kind of looking at uh, definitely the controls what type of controls what's the location of those controls um, for heating systems you definitely want to understand what type of fuel supply whether it's propane natural gas or oil um, and if it's electric heat then it's obviously going to be electric heating and cooling uh, units what type uh, that you're going to be running into. That's why we're kind of going over the categories. And then also the distribution system, which is your ductwork, understanding how, how the importance of uh, supply air uh, affects these systems and the performance of the equipment. So kind of have a little diagram here for you. So you're looking at your thermostats, identifying the fuel source, identifying the appliance, and then also your duct system. So for electric heat, a lot of times you're going to run into whether it's uh, electric heat strips, baseboard electric heating, or if it's an air handler uh, that uses a heat pump type or maybe even a combination of heat pump using refrigeration as a heating method, along with some type of auxiliary heat strips. So these are just some of the things that uh, you guys will be coming across. And the simplest form of, of checking a lot of this is really just turning it on, making sure that it is uh, doing what it's supposed to do um, at your guys' level. When I teach this on for technicians, there's a lot more that goes into these and checking the accuracy of how these components actually operate. Um, but for you guys, uh, you don't have to go in as depth um, when you guys are doing home inspections on uh, electric heat type furnaces. Gas furnaces, there's a couple of different types that you're going to run into. We'll get more in depth when we start talking about the categories, but uh, the two main ones that you're going to notice is either going to be like an 80% furnace or a 90 plus percent furnace. And if you come across really old homes with really old furnaces, you're going to be looking at uh, the old styles that that may be 60% or 70% type furnaces. They're no longer manufactured uh, that way. Um, and they do uh, have the same capabilities of operation the way that the 80% furnaces operate uh, in a sense. But there are a few differences and we'll point those out when we get to the categories. So with gas heating, uh, we do have a heat exchanger. This is where your burner ports are gonna basically send a fire directly into the burner ports in a heat exchanger. And as those exhaust gases go through, it's gonna heat up that heat exchanger and that is where your heating is gonna come from. Another type is oil fired. Uh, these are more common uh, in Northern areas of the country. Um, being here in Phoenix, Arizona, I, I don't typically run into any type of oil fired uh, system unless it's on the com commercial or industrial side. But for residential, uh, this would just be uh, overkill for the location that I'm currently in. But a lot of you may have ran into oil type heating systems that are out there. One big difference between an oil fired and a natural gas type system or propane system is that it has its own burner uh, that's completely separate from the unit. Even though it's mounted onto the unit, um, this component right here, the gun type burner, actually does everything internal and produces the flame. So it has the oil pump, it has its own centrifugal fan to pull in mixed air. And then it also has its own igniter to ignite the, the air fuel combination and then produces its uh, a flame on that. So let's get into some of the categories uh, that you guys deal with uh, for oil and gas type heating systems. 
And what this really kind of boils down to is your uh, flu, whether it's a negative pressure flu or positive pressure flu, whether it's condensing or non-condensing. A lot of times you should be able to just look at a system and be able to tell whether it falls under a CAT1 or a CAT4 appliance. Uh, three and four, or, or two and three are going to be not as um, prevalent that you guys are going to run into in residential systems. Um, so we'll kind of focus more on the CAT1 and the CAT4 categories. So if you kind of look at this chart here, uh, you have a flu negative pressure and non-condensing for a CAT1. Those are typically going to be your older furnaces that are 60% efficient all up to your current 80% efficient systems. And what that means is, is that the inducer fan that are mounted on here to help the uh, flue gases um, go outside of the heat exchanger is it creates a negative pressure within that heat exchanger. And even though it's kind of pulling those fumes through that heat exchanger at a negative pressure, it still does not positively pressurize the flue. So the flue is still a lesser pressure than the condition space or the attic or crawl space underneath a home. Um, Non-condensing, as you heat uh, fuel, and you have byproducts of combustion, one of those byproducts is gonna be water or water vapor. And if that water or that water vapor cools too quickly, what'll happen is it'll start to condense. So typically these flu type appliances at a CAT1 uh, being one non-pressure compared to the surrounding area of that vent, and it's not gonna allow it to get that cool, at least it should not. Um, it is very close to becoming a condensing type furnace, as long as those stack temperatures are where they're supposed to be, typically between 300 and 400 degrees uh, is what you're typically going to find on these stack temp uh, category one type furnaces. Um, your cat four, um, well, I kind of go through all of them. So cat two, it's also going to be a negative pressure flue vent, but it's going to be a condensing type. Again, you're not really gonna uh, run across a lot of these, um, but if you do, uh, just know that the material makeup is gonna be a little bit different to be able to handle some of that condensing flu uh, byproducts um, in that system. Or else, if we use the same venting as the CAT1, then it could actually rust out and damage the equipment. Um, type three, you're really not going to see um, out there. That's going to be, again, more of your commercial industrial type systems, um, but it does have a positive flu and it is also a non condensing uh, type furnace. Category four, these are going to be more prevalent. This, as, as the industry changes with higher efficient type systems, CAT4 is going to be installed. Uh, more frequently as, as units are getting changed out. And a couple of reasons why. One, they are more efficient. 90 plus percent um, can range anywhere from 90 percent all the way up to 98 percent. And I believe some manufacturers actually have some 99 percent furnaces out there. That just means when it, we talk about percentages on fuel is that every dollar you spend on fuel, um, your rate of return off those that money is is going to be a little bit less so if it's a 98 percent furnace every dollar you spend you're losing two cents out of that flu stack on efficiency on the 80 percenters for every dollar spent um, you're losing 20 cents on every dollar on energy efficiency electric on the other hand is always going to be 100 percent typically because if I pay 100% of electricity, I'm using the 100% of that electricity to get my heating source. So that's kind of a little bit of the, the differences that are out there when it comes to our different categories and kind of what they mean as far as our flu, flu vent pressures and our flu gas temperatures and along with our venting material. Now we kind of mentioned about the inducer draft motor. This is what creates that negative pressure in that heat exchanger on the 80% furnaces. 
So as it creates that negative pressure, it pulls those flue gases through that heat exchanger um, to get as much out of it as possible based on its design and then exhaust it out through the flue, still at a lesser pressure uh, than the positive pressure systems. Hey, hey Eric, just uh, one more thing. Can you go back to that slide with the four sure. categories? Taking a look at category one. Now, if I'm a home inspector and I come across a category one, it's a natural draft furnace. Um, they stop making them. What, what would you recommend if I'm a home inspector and I come across a natural draft gas furnace and it looks old because it actually is indeed old? Um, which, what, do you, what should a home inspector say? Like this is, it's likely like it's, it could be functional, but you can't possibly be relying on it. Oh, absolutely. Um, my definitely my recommendation and same when when I was a, a, a contractor, uh, if I go into a homeowner's house and I see something like this, uh, my first recommendation is, is, hey, this is this is very old equipment. Uh, you're losing a lot of energy. You're losing a lot of money every single time you're operating this piece of equipment. And I definitely recommend uh, replacement. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the first thing uh, that I offer to my homeowners. And that's right. what I would also recommend as, as a home inspector is I would write that up. Hey, it's an outdated furnace. You're losing energy. And my recommendation, at least as a recommendation to change that out. There's a high probability that there could be something wrong with the heat exchanger, a crack or rust because it's so old and aged. Oh, absolutely. So from a manufacturer's standpoint, heat exchangers typically come with a 20 year warranty um, in case anything ever happens that heat exchanger. So these furnaces are way over that 20 year time period. So one, they're not under warranty Two, you do risk uh, the expansion and contraction of that metal over that period of time to have uh, multiple issues with those types of furnaces. And it's, it's just way better to, to replace those, at least put the recommendation in for replacement. And if they don't have carbon monoxide testers, um, I would definitely not to operate it without a carbon monoxide tester, just in case uh, that there is a crack heat exchanger. Now, category four, it produces condensate. Category one, no condensate. If I see, if I observe indications of some kind of condensate on a category one, vent connection pipe like the white salt deposits or something like that coming down or just just indications of watermarks that there's something wrong with the draft or something right oh or absolutely um that usually typically will indicate that you might not have complete combustion um that'll that'll cause it as well that means your flue gases aren't getting hot enough or they're cooling too fast so one of the two it could be a back draft or a down draft on that vent appliance and it's cause it's just cooling those uh, uh, water molecules uh, way too quickly and that will leak down back into the combustion chamber and i've got some slides that kind of kind of show that uh, of, of kind of what to look for when you're doing a home inspection and again my recommendation even when i was a contractor if i saw this uh, kind of going on on an 80 percent furnace then I, I also recommended uh, changing that out because you don't know how how damaged that piece of equipment actually is and can in, potentially you know uh, end up hurting a homeowner okay yeah. thanks thanks you're welcome so again this was the industrial draft motor for the 80 percent efficient furnaces and then as i mentioned before on the 90 percent or 90 plus percent furnaces you have a higher uh, efficient inducer draft motor. It's a little bit more powerful, still creates a negative pressure within that heat exchanger. But on these systems, they have typically two separate heat exchangers. You have a main or a primary heat exchanger, and then you have a secondary heat exchanger just to get as much energy efficiency as you can out of these systems. And here's the interesting part about these is that as, it, as the flue gases are going through this heat exchanger and air is being blown across, cooling that heat exchanger or transferring that heat to the air to supply to the home, in that secondary heat exchanger, it actually gets cool enough. That's where your condensation starts. So you'll actually have water sitting in the bottom of that secondary heat exchanger. Um, and interesting part, just a physics note, 
is that as water sits there and goes from a vapor to a liquid, um, it takes more heat to be able to do that. So they actually pick up more heat just in that thermodynamics process of changing state from a vapor to a liquid. That's what makes these so much more efficient. And then typically your stack fluke stack temperatures coming out of these systems, you're anywhere from 100 degrees to 140 degrees max. Um, but on these, because it is a more powerful inducer motor, you have a positive vent stack, which means that it has to be sealed. This is a, called also a sealed combustion type uh, system. So one of the things I would be looking for externally on these systems is one, do I have condensation drain coming out of the system? Is it flowing? And two, is my vent pipe glued together or sealed properly? Those are gonna be some of the things that I would be looking for on these types of systems. Some of the materials that you're gonna be seeing for uh, vent piping, um, BH, uh, type vent you're going to see on these 90 percent plus furnaces uh, they could be metallic or plastic pvc uh, type pipe uh, pvc is going to be your most common more so than the bh metallic um, that's going to be for your category four your type b vents um, can be on your type one or type two uh, systems these just interlock they literally just slip on quick twist and they lock in place. Again, you're not gonna seal them uh, fully, which again, it's a negative vent pressure. So it doesn't have to be sealed like it does on a 90% plus furnace. Single wall vent connectors. Um, you're not really gonna see these uh, too much. You should see a little bit of C-vent um, connected directly to the furnace before the B-vent is applied. Uh, I've been out on many, many jobs where I get there and the B vent runs all the way down to the furnace. There should be a little bit of a single wall, usually about six to 12 inches of single wall. And for the, the reason for that is that technicians need a place to be able to take measurements of that flue gas when they're doing their checks. Um, B vent, you never want to drill holes through. And so that's why it's always recommended by the manufacturer to have a little bit of single wall right out of the uh, furnace. Uh, just so that the technician can take measurements and checks. Um, A-vents. A-vents are going to be your, your stainless steel type venting systems uh, that can be ran through chimneys. Um, and I've got a few other uh, diagrams that kind of kind of illustrate where you'll see those applications. But again, that's going to fall under more either through a chimney vent, you may see it, or on more commercial industrial type systems. Again, uh, category one uses B vent, and you can always check the uh, IFGC to be able to ensure that it has been installed properly based on their charts and their information uh, that they publish out there to the industry. Again, even as manufacturers, uh, they still go by all the different codes that are out there to be able to set up their installation guides for the technician to install properly. Here's that category two can be V bent uh, and also it can be some type of specialized material. Again, you're not going to run into this that frequently, but this is this is what can be used on type two heating equipment. Now, type three maybe you use uh, stainless steel type. This is where our A vent uh, comes in. Um, or you have this type of, of vending material that has actual clamps that go around it and make a good seal because again, type three, um, we're looking at a, a, a similar to a positive uh, pressure. It's not gonna be as positive as your 90 percenters, but it's still gonna be positive enough to where we wanna make sure we've got a, a good seal on those uh, vending materials. Again, this is just a diagram of that A vent coming out um, outside external to a home. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a temperature range. Typically these uh, fluid temperatures exceed 470 degrees. So they're very, very high temperature type. And anytime you have any type of venting going through or transitioning through a home, 
Um, understanding the temperature is, uh, is a huge key because if I have flu temperatures going through my vent, going through that stack and ex exiting out of a home, then there may be materials that could potentially um, ignite and catch on fire if not properly transitioned outside of that home correctly. So that would be another thing that I would kind of look for. B vent is double walled, so it definitely has its own layer of protection. Um, so that last external part of that venting system should not get hot enough to actually cause anything to ignite, but it does get warm if you've ever touched a B vent while it was operating. <clears throat> Again, our category four type, as you can see here, we're using PVC and you can see where the glue marks are, where it is sealed correctly uh, so that it doesn't release that positive pressure flue gases into the conditioned space or within the home. Here's a category one setup. This looks like it's uh, installed underneath a house. Um, and one of the one of the key things on uh, category one also is that it uses the surrounding air um, for combustion. So if it's in a if it's in an area where it's not getting sufficient amount of air, um, it can starve that combustion cycle and prevent that uh, furnace from operating properly. So that area is known as the CAS uh, for combustion air. That's just that surrounding air that it uses uh, for combustion. And now here's a picture. There oh, go ahead, Vince. That shouldn't be resting on the concrete, right? We should be lifting that up no. and have it underneath it. You are correct. And it's, it's interesting to be able to find a lot of pictures <laughs> that uh, where systems were not um, installed properly. As you can see, you definitely have a, a uh, coil on the top end of that furnace for the AC section, and it definitely should be suspended um, and secured properly along with probably an external uh, or emergency drain pan. Keep anything from uh, damaging underneath that home. Now here's our old furnaces. This is what we were talking about, Ben, with the, uh, the old 60 or 70% natural draft furnaces. These do not have the inducer motors uh, like the newer category one furnaces have. These actually have a negative pressure inside the system and it has an opening um, in the front that allows for additional air to be drawn up through the flue and mix with those uh, combustion gases. So if you look at the grill down at the bottom, that small grill is used to pull in combustion air for the combustion system, but that top opening is used to draw in um, surrounding air to mix with the flue gases to help that get outside the home. Problem with these systems also is that if there is a downdraft or a barometric pressure change externally, like a storm, um, and this system is running, it can cause those flue gases to be pushed back into the home. Um, and that's another reason we were kind of talking about that I would definitely recommend changing these out, not just the heat exchanger, but also these uh, have multiple different uh, potentials for additional hazards to a homeowner. Kind of a breakout of a cat one type system. As you, one thing I want to point out on these, your burner assembly is down at the very bottom. Okay, so that's one way to identify a cat one 80% furnace. You also notice that the door panel on the bottom, you can kind of see it to the far right of that burner assembly, you have a louvered panel. Anytime you have a louvered panel, that's going to fall under a cat one uh, to be able to pull in the combustion air um, from that CAS area. And then as it burns, it goes up the heat exchanger and then is pulled through by the inducer motor and then out the flue stack. And that, that's going to be a typical setup, regardless of manufacturer for uh, category one system. <clears throat> category two, like I said, you're not really going to see these um, out there. 
but a uh, similar setup to a category one, but they're just going to be a little bit different. Um, most residential appliance manufacturers don't even manufacture a category two type furnace for residential systems. Um, your cat three, uh, like I said, you may run into some of these. Um, typically it's going to be focused in dealing with your, your oil type uh, burner type systems. So a little bit different setup and I'll kind of, I have a few other breakouts that'll kind of show some of the differences on the oils, how it either goes through a, a complete heat exchanger, um, kind of like an S type or how it goes through a barrel type like the one shown in this picture. Kind of a breakout just to give you guys an idea of how the air is going across that heat exchanger, picking up that heat and then kind of a breakout of that um, burner uh, system, the combustion system on this one's a 90 percenter type furnace. The way I can tell and distinguish between a 90 percenter, a, a cat four, and that 80 percenter is look where the burner location is on this system. It's up at the top. So what we do is we create our combustion at the top and then we use that inducer draft to pull it down through the heat exchanger as air is blowing across it and then also hitting that secondary heat exchanger before it goes up through the uh, um, exhaust out of the system and to the outside of the home. Another thing about the category four, it is a sealed combustion chamber. The reason there's two pipes is because one, there's no louvers on the front of these cabinets. So it's not using air for combustion within the CAS. It's using air from outside. It actually has its own piping system for combustion air. And that inducer helps pull that uh, air for combustion from the outside piped into the system uses it for combustion air and then pulls the byproducts of combustion out through the secondary uh, piping system or the flu vent pipe and exhaust it to the outside. All right, uh, any, any questions on that before we go on to the next section? No? Yes, or, from 20 feet away for a home inspector, 20 feet away, you should be able to identify the, the category from 20 feet away. What would those uh characteristics be if you're just looking from 20 feet away i was taking, so, i was taking some notes like if you got louvered and uh, louvers in the front that's category one seal chamber category four metal yes. pipes, metal pipes category one two plastic pipes category four burn yes and then, burn location on the bottom category one burn location on top category four and if you got a condensate pump that's category four Correct. Yes. If you've got condensation coming out of the furnace, that's also going to fall under that category four because we've got to get rid of those um, condensed byproducts of combustion outside the outside the furnace or it'll end up rusting out the bottom of that uh, that, that secondary heat exchanger. Cool. All right. Um, going on to the next slide for sequence of operations. So um, as a home inspector, one of the things that I'm going to probably kind of look for, and I do this as a technician, is, you know, I go to my thermostat, I set a call for heat, and I can literally listen to the sequence of operation and kind of hear that whole furnace system um, go through its checks um, and, and ignite. And I'll kind of run through these real quick. So I go to my thermostat, call for heat. What's going to happen is the draft motor is going to start. The reason this happens is that that furnace is now designed that if I, my draft motor is not running, I don't need to start because now I'm going to create uh, potential harmful gases that aren't going to be pulled through the heat exchanger and can potentially uh, fill up the home. So that's one of the first safeties and first items that actually kicks on. Once that draft is proven, typically through a pressure switch, that pressure switch will close on a negative pressure, tells the board, okay, I've got draft. And then the ignition process is gonna start. I'm gonna send a signal to my gas valve, opening the gas valve, allowing gas to travel to the combustion chamber. Um, 
and it's mixing with uh, external air. And then my igniter is also going to light up. Uh, if it's a spark igniter, you're going to hear the ticking of that spark igniter. Um, if it's a standing pilot, you're not really going to hear anything. It's just going to uh, light those burner ports um, as soon as that gas and air mixture reaches the combustion chamber. And then it's also got a flame sensor inside of the flame that as the flame hits that sensor, it creates a milli, milliamp or a millivolt and sends that signal back to the board and says, OK, we've got uh, we've got ignition and we've got a flame. Once that's proven, my heat exchanger starts to warm up and then the blower starts. So all this happens in a sequence. It's not all of a sudden um, I've had customers call me and go, hey, I turned my furnace on and then it's usually about a few minutes before my blower kicks on. And I go, yes, that is that is correct. <laughs> Um, it usually takes that long and it'll go through some fail safes. And if it doesn't hit those fail safes, uh, then ignition should happen. But if different things happen or if there's a problem in the system, it will not ignite. And so from a home inspector point of view, um, if you're inspecting a home and it goes through the cycle and lights and is running and we get all the way to the combustion, then it, everything should be fairly good. Everything else from that point forward uh, may be needed to be checked by a technician. But if you're going through that cycle and it's going into fail mode, uh, definitely there's a problem and, and definitely a technician needs to come out there and inspect it and figure out what's going on with that piece of equipment. Um, from an electrical standpoint, I kind of put this together just so you guys kind of have a mental note of kind of how the system works. Power from the breaker goes to a switch on the outside of a furnace. Furnace has an internal switch uh, known as a door switch. So when that panel is not on correctly, that door switch is open. Um, that, that prevents anybody from starting this system uh, that's not qualified without that uh, door being on. Then it sends signal to my transformer, which signals, uh, sends power over to my thermostat. So now I can control everything by control voltage. Board is kind of the brain. It kind of tells and sends signals to different places to tell things what to kick on at what time in that sequence of operation. First sends a signal to my inducer. Pressure switch closes, sends power back, letting the board know that we have inducer draft is working properly. Then sends a signal to my gas valve, then to my ignition. And once that heat exchanger kicks on, the last thing that kicks on is going to be my blower fan motor. And then it does this all the way until my thermostat will satisfy. Let's see here. All right. So two stage and variable speed. We I've, I've always heard I've, I've even gone out to calls after home inspectors have gone to a home and said, hey, I've checked this and checked that. And these are my notes and I just need somebody to verify it. Um, one of the things to be different um, and it's going to be more prevalent as time goes on with these higher efficient units two stage or variable speed is that one you want to test these in second stage and typically how you do that is you run that temperature up let's say the house is 70 degrees and you're doing an inspection run that thermostat up to 80. Um, the further that gap between what it is and what you're trying to heat to that's going to cause that system to go into second stage. Give it about 15 minutes before you run your checks. And that's basically saying that, hey, this system's running at 100% optimal capacity, <clears throat> which is where you want to be when you do these checks. Um, same with variable speed. But variable speed does take longer. It steps it up in stages. So to get it all the way to 100% cap cap uh, capacity on a variable speed system, you're going to have to let it run for 20 to 25 minutes before you actually do your test because it's it'll stage up every five minutes and that's typically across the board with any manufacturer on variable speeds all right safeties and controls um gas fired appliances are very very dangerous um without the safety components there and the reason they're there uh one is for codes and then two is to prevent one a house from catching on fire 
or any other type of uh, problem that exists, it prevents it from running. Because we are using a natural fuel source um, for combustion, anything can possibly go wrong with these systems. And manufacturers have done a great job of putting controls into place to alleviate uh, most of the issues that could potentially happen within these systems. So if you ever walk up to a system and you see wires everywhere and things are jumpered out, I'll be honest with you, I, I even as a technician, I would not even run the equipment. Uh, you don't know who's jumped what safeties and it could be a potential hazard uh, for you even just operating that piece of equipment. Uh, first safety is going to be that uh, pressure switch that's there again just to make sure that inducer fan motor kicks on. Um, and that's what what it's going to kind of control. Uh, your other safeties that you have, you have these numerous um, temperature switches that are preset for a certain temperature and they're placed all throughout the furnace uh, cabinet around where the um, combustion chamber is. And this is to sense the temperature. If the temperature gets too hot above the design specs, these are designed to trip out. That means that there's a problem with the combustion. Maybe I don't have enough airflow across that heat exchanger. My heat exchanger is getting too hot and I don't want to damage that heat exchanger. So I want these safeties in place and operating properly to make sure that I'm not doing more damage to that equipment or potentially um, damaging somebody's home or uh, hurting somebody. Control uh, boards, they're the brain of the whole operation. Um, years and years ago, if you, I mean, if you look at the really old type furnaces, you didn't have control boards. They usually had like some kind of relay or um, some type of control that kind of jumped from one relay to another. Uh, boards kind of overtaken that kind of technology. So these relay boards, uh, they do everything internal. Your gas valve, <clears throat> um, again, that's gonna have supply uh, fuel system source going to the gas valve at a certain pressure, and then it's gonna regulate that pressure down to a working pressure. If I go and I start a furnace and I've got a flame that's just roaring and is, is very, very strong, um, that's going to be an indication to me that I might have my gas valve might not be producing the correct amount of uh, pressure of gas to my combustion chamber. And that could be a huge, huge problem. So just something to kind of think about if you do see a flame or hear a flame that's just roaring um, uncontrollably. Some of the components, heat exchangers. These are just different types of heat exchangers you might come across. They're very hard to see. They're all hidden within the cabinet, typically. Um, but these are what they look like um, that are going to be out there. The one on the on the top right, that's your 90 plus percent furnace heat exchanger. You have your main loops, and then it goes down into a secondary heat exchanger um, to get as much efficiency out of them as possible. The one on the bottom left or bottom center is actually going to be your 80% plus furnace uh, type heat exchangers for the most part. And same with the ones on the left. It just depends on the manufacturer and which type of heat exchangers that they're actually using. Here's a problem we run into with heat exchangers. Um, they do fail. They can fail. And if you ever start up a furnace and you're looking at the flame as it's going and the flame is dancing, it's kind of moving around in that port area um, and it's not steady, um, that's a great indication that there may be a cracked heat exchanger. In that case, I would shut the equipment off. If you do have a carbon monoxide tester, you can check at the vents or registers and see if you are sensing any carbon uh, monoxide. Um, and if so, shut it off completely, condemn the unit, and, uh, and definitely tell the homeowner they cannot operate that piece of equipment um, until it is repaired or it, uh, changed out. <clears throat> so venting, we already talked about venting types as far as appliances, but now let's see where they need to transfer out of any type of home. Um, as a venting system, we want to make sure, one, we're not venting flue gases 
into the condition space. We want to remove all flue gases to the outside atmosphere. Prevention, we want to prevent any damage uh, from condensation if it's not a uh, 90 plus percent furnace. So we don't want that to condense before it exits out the home. And we, of course, we want to take care of the building structure uh, from any kind of fire hazards. And that's that transition I was talking about earlier. Um, again, here's some here's some pictures of some proper uh, transitions for those flue gases kind of coming out of the home, kind of keeping it away from that combustible material. Um, also here, it kind of identifies what our products of combustion are. We have carbon, di carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water vapor, and carbon monoxide. And they've all got to be removed outside the home. These things do happen. Um, furnace isn't operating properly. The flue gas, flues get too hot or out of spec. Uh, maybe a technician was working on it, couldn't figure out the problem, but knew a safety was the problem. So he jumpered it out. And next thing you know, the house burns down because something caught on fire or it wasn't installed properly. And ironically, as much as I've been in this field, um, you do see a lot of companies and a lot of technicians that really don't know how to install some of this equipment. Um, and, and I say that uh, because there's many, many different types of, of companies that will go get their license, get started. I can tell you, for an example, here in Phoenix, Arizona, 1,100 licensed HVAC contractors. Um, and with that many out there, people are just getting the license and they're not really following the practices. And so you guys actually have the opportunity uh, to identify something when it was installed incorrectly, uh, either per manufacturer specs or by any of the local or national codes. When you kind of talk about, go ahead. When you install an HVAC system, are you required to um, keep the manufacturing installation instructions uh, on the unit itself, like in a bag or a, a holder? Yes. Um, so typically two, two things I usually do. One, uh, the homeowner is the one who actually purchased the equipment. So typically I take all the literature for that piece of equipment and I'll, I'll give it to the homeowner. And I know a lot of contractors, they'll put it right in the cabinet just so if technicians need to come out there. Um, and you can do it either way. There's nothing saying that it has to be within the chamber uh, so a technician has it right away. Um, I, I prefer to give it to the homeowner and just tell the homeowner, hey, look, keep this in a safe place um, and, and hang on to it. Don't throw this away. Uh, the good thing about the newer pieces of equipment, um, right inside the unit on the data plate for the furnace, uh, a lot of manufacturers are putting these QR codes. So as a technician, even if the literature is not there, I can actually scan it and it'll bring up all the literature on that piece of equipment that I'm actually looking at. And I can kind of glance through it to kind of see uh, different uh, technical stuff and then also if it was installed correctly per the manufacturer specs. Are you saying that's on the front panel or on the motherboard, that QR code? So as soon as you open the panel where the combustion chamber is, there's usually a sticker, a data plate sticker um, right on the either right or left side of the cabinet. Cool. So those are, uh, and it's a great tool and I'm kind of glad that they're doing that. <laughs> Make, makes it a lot easier, especially when literature has been lost over the years. So, but no, it's not a requirement to leave it in the uh, equipment. Um, some of the things you want to look for, damage and prevention from condensation. If I've got an 80% furnace and I, and I open it up and it looks like this, I've got a condensation issue with that flue gases. So, Immediately, I'm probably going to write that up and recommend to whoever my customer is, is that, hey, you need to get a service technician over here to uh, further diagnose what's going on with this system. Typically, if I come out and I see that as a technician, my recommendation is automatically going to be replace the system. Um, this just kind of indicates a couple of problems associated with venting systems. This one's showing a 90 percenter. 
Um, this one's coming out near the bottom um, of a home. So as you can see, a two pipe system, one's gonna be your air intake, that's gonna be your uh, top one. And then the one at the on the right is aiming downward, that's gonna be your, your, um, uh, your exhaust flue gases. Now, I can tell you this, based on just looking at this picture, is my flue gases are showing going down and my intake is higher, I'm probably going to be pulling in some of those exhaust fumes for combustion air, and that's not going to be good either. And we'll kind of look at this a little bit more in some other slides. But uh, definitely want to make sure those are clear, not plugged, um, unrestricted from anything on the outside. And I've got a lot of a lot of pictures that'll that'll depict some of the wrong ways of of venting these type of systems uh, as we go down through these slides. Now, venting design, um, a lot of times, especially as a, as either uh, a homeowner or let's say even if you guys are inspecting things, if you go on and you're like, okay, I'm going to go turn every single thing on, make sure they work all at the same time, you could potentially be starving that furnace of air. Um, it uses, if especially an 80 percenter or less, is going to use air for combustion that's around it within that CAS system. And so if I've got vent fans going, I've got dryers going, I've got other appliances that are exhausting air out of my home, I'm going to create a negative pressure in that house. Once I do that, I'm going to starve combustion air from that furnace. So when I go and take my temperature measurements or look at the operation of this furnace, I may have created additional problems just by kicking everything on. So I would always say, if, if you run across a situation like this, uh, run the furnace first, get it up to temperature and uh, do your checks on it before you go and turn on other appliances because you could, you could be seeing a problem uh, that's, that's really not a problem. It's just because everything else is running and exhausting stuff out of that home and creating a negative pressure. I've gone to jobs where the Saturday morning they're cooking breakfast, got the kitchen vent fan on. They're also doing a load of laundry and they've been having furnace problems. Well, I get there, they're not doing that any longer and there's no problem that I'm able to see. It's only happening when all these things are running. One, another thing to kind of look at when you guys see the vent piping is it should always be to somewhat pitched in an upward direction for the exhaust vents. Um, and this particular is on the 80% plus, and here's why, it's natural draft. So we're at a negative pressure in that heat exchanger along with the negative pressure in that stack that we want that to naturally draft upward. If there's any bends or any pitches downward, now we've created an area where it can start to cool off and then we're gonna get condensing within that flue pipe which water and metal do not mix. So you will eventually rust it out and now you're gonna create additional issues with that. So always make sure there's at least some type of pitch in an upward manner uh, when inspecting uh, vent pipes and how they're secured. Um, Again, just some additional things to kind of look at when you're looking at the 95% furnaces and you're looking at the vent pipes, uh, make sure that they are strapped. They should be strapped with some type of metal or plastic or large wire ties. Um, and they should be strapped in a manner that they're not sagging. If you ever see PDC pipe over a long period of run, they'll start to sag. Uh, that should not be like that. It should be secured well enough so that you don't get any kind of sag on that uh, venting. Um, a couple more slides and then we'll, we'll go on a quick short break. Um, single pipe systems. Again, this kind of illustrates that negative pressure in that home with a single pipe vent only and exhausting out of that home. Call also known as a non direct vent. They're less of efficient than a two pipe system. They freeze up less and they also cost less to install, but they're harder on the heat exchanger and the combustion air from wherever the furnace is located. 
again, this, this depicts that uh, air issue for combustion air, uh, getting proper combustion to that furnace. And then if we look at the different design on the more higher efficient furnaces, we don't have that problem with the two pipe system on a 90 plus percenter because we're pulling air from the outside area, not in the CAS around the furnace. And then we're sending it through a sealed combustion chamber and then exhausting it right back out of the of the home. So this doesn't play a factor on it. So not only is it more efficient, you actually deal with less problems in operating. And it's also it's known as a direct vent system. It's also very, very quiet compared to an 80% furnace because of that silk uh, combustion chamber. And we talked about that improved efficiencies. Um, we'll go ahead and take a break then. Um, we're about at the, right at that one hour mark. Sure. And then we'll come back and we'll kind of show some pictures for the uh, different venting transitions coming out of a home. Sure, that sounds good. How about at the top of the hour? We'll start again. That sounds perfect. Okay, so that's about four minutes, maybe a little bit less. Um, so Eric, you can take a break. Folks, everybody can take a break. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stay on live and I want to take questions from anyone attending the live webinar uh, that's not related to the topic, um, but is about Internet Cheat. So um, I'm here to answer your questions. If you have a question about Internet Cheat, Internet Cheat membership, uh, business, uh, marketing, websites or anything like that, um, we can talk and I'll answer your questions if you like while we're on this little break. So everybody take a few minutes, get a break, uh, hit the restroom, uh, reheat your coffee, and Eric will be back and we'll start again in about three or four minutes or so. Um, but if you're interested, um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's move everything out of the way. And what I want to share with you is if you're a member or a non-member of Internet Let's see, I wanna make sure I got my controls so I can come back. Um, go to natchi.org slash everything, natchi.org slash everything, N-A-C-H-I dot O-R-G slash backslash, that's that little uh, slash by the question mark on your keyboard, um, everything. And uh, this is a 15 step checklist on how to become successful as a home inspector. Right, some advice. And there's 15 steps. So if you are a member of Internachi, if you're not a member of Internachi, I still recommend going through it. Uh, step one is join Internachi as an organization. Um, and uh, if you're not a member, feel free to ask me uh, how to become a member, or you can go step one. Um, step two is to get trained and certified. Let's just jump there right now. So if you are interested in becoming a home inspector, we have the home inspector certification program. It's free and online for Internet G members. We also have 60 different types of inspector certifications, and they're all free and online. And because we're a home inspector college, accredited by a national accrediting agency, recognized by the U.S. Department of Education, you're a real college student. And uh, it's a tuition-free school uh, with internetg.edu. And you can take any of our certification courses. So if you wanted to be a four-point inspector, that's important down in Florida. If you want to become a drone pilot, we have a drone pilot training course. Uh, if you wanted to know more about lawn irrigation systems, you can become a lawn irrigation system inspector uh, certified through Internet G, and that's one of the steps. You want to diversify your services by being trained and certified in various types of inspection services. So you're you're not just a home inspector, but if you're if you're doing a home inspection and uh, you happen to feel that high humidity in the basement or crawl space. You may see some water intrusion problems, maybe some condensation on the windows on the inside during certain climates conditions. Um, you may want to become a moisture intrusion inspector, certified mold inspector, and then turn to your client during a home inspection and say, while I'm here, why don't I take a look at this potential problem for you? Um, Joseph asks, how am I recording attendance? Do I take attendance for webinars? So um, the attendance will be taken through our Zoom system. I, we can see who attends, uh, how long you've been attending, and then you can upload um, evidence or proof that you've attended the entire class into your Internet G dashboard and get credit for it. 
if there isn't state licensing credits for webinars like this, right? They're live, they're kind of informal, we can go off topic. And states don't really like that. They like more formal classes. And that's what we do online. So it's through our Home Inspector College, you can take a course that's state approved for state CE. That's what I would do. If you're an Energy member, it's free and online and it's learning at your own pace. So Roy, that's the question. Is Energy credited towards CE for state license? Yes. So we're recognized by all the states. If you have um, a reg if you're a home inspector in a regulated state, Energy is approved by, by that state to provide free CE, but they don't like to issue or award credit. Um, the state licensing boards don't like to issue or award credits for webinars like this that are informal. Um, and uh, you can't get CE by watching a video if you're happy to be watching a video right now. Um, William asks about uh, connecting C PVC pipes. We can ask Eric about that um, when he comes back on in a minute or two. Um, let's see, a couple of questions about material defects. We, with only, Paul asked, with only three categories to describe a problem on Spectora software, how do you differentiate between material defect, major, minor issues, health safety issues, and maintenance comments? That's a fantastic question. And we answer that in the um, report writing defect course. So we have a course about how to observe and identify defects, and then how do you report upon uh, those observations um, accurately? And material defect is that special kind of defect that Eric kind of touched on that is gonna hurt somebody. Um, it's gonna have an adverse impact on the value of the home or put somebody um, in a, a, a dangerous situation where someone's gonna get hurt. And that's called a material defect. Doesn't mean like it's made out of concrete or cotton, not, not that kind of material, but um, a material defect meaning major uh, where there's an imminent um, danger to someone. So um, we help you identify those types of, of defects. And those different types of defects, Paul, that you mentioned, they're also in our glossary. So you can look up those definitions. What is a material defect? What is a safety? What is a major or minor defect? And uh, if you need any additional help, feel free to email me, ben at internachi.org. And I can see our instructor has come back. Uh, <laughs> awesome. I think, I think you can just grab the screen again. Can you screen share? Let me get to. There we go. All right. So you got the right screen that you're seeing. Let's see, it's coming up. Okay. I see uh, I see black. Let's give that another try. Let's right. so put it on my side. A little different. Room. There we go. Now we've got it. Does that come up now? No, I see just uh, just black on my side. Okay, let's see here. What is that? Let me stop sharing for a second. And let's try this one. Is that still not coming up? Interesting. Let's see. If you can, uh, folks, if you can chat whether you can see Eric's screen or not. I see black on my side. No. Paul says no. So if you uh, maybe close out your PowerPoint presentation, still see black, black on my side. Then bring up close that real quick and I'll reopen it. Let me make sure. Yeah. Slide. And when you share, you gotta find that opened PowerPoint presentation screen. Here we go. Let's try this.
And if that doesn't work, then there's <laughs> and log out completely out of Zoom and then log back in. All right, this should this should work. Into the right slide and Okay, let me go to share screen. So while Eric's doing that, Matthew, you're talking about Ontario, Canada, unregulated except for legal stuff. We're moving towards regulation, wondering if international certification might apply. Yep. So we are um, working with our good folks in on Canada to make sure that we can serve our members in Ontario. Um, and Eric, it's still a black screen there, I believe. Folks, can you see Eric's screen? Paul asks, how long do you have to, same, yep, nope. How long do you have after completing courses to take the state test? Is there a time limit before having to retake classes? How long do you have after completing courses to take the state test? So Paul, where are you from? Why don't you chat where you're from so I can help you in that regards? Because if there's a state exam, uh, most state exams are available to you uh, at any time. Uh, I can't think of any state exam where you have to do education in order to qualify. Like for Florida, for example, you can take the Florida home inspector exam at any time. I don't know, Eric. I don't know what's, what's going on. Let's try this. One more, one more try on this. Um, <clears throat> Maybe try a screen and then slide. Or you, if you're using two monitors, Illinois. Paul says Illinois. So yeah, you can. Um, you know what you can do? There's a internationally chapter, member chapter in Illinois, and they're really good um, at helping folks get licensed. Uh, we have some chapter presidents there some folks who teach live classes, certified master inspectors. So where you wanna go, where you wanna go, Paul, is nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I dot O-R-G slash Illinois. And then scroll down that page and find resources that you need about taking that state exam. Roy says, MS, Mississippi exams require 60 hours of education, but not clear on timeline, yep. Is that coming up now? No, it isn't, Eric. No. Folks, do you see Eric's? Yeah. So, Ibrahim says you might be showing your second monitor by mistake or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me try. Let's try changing that one. Um, so, go, Paul uh, and Roy, and everybody who's who's wondering about state requirements, you can always go to a natchi.org page, natchi.org slash, and then just type in your state. If you're in Washington, DC, no space. So just type in New Jersey, New York, no space. So type in your state after natchi.org and a slash and get more state specific information there. And we also have a contact page. So go to any natchi.org contact page. I mean, our any natchi.org page, and then at the top, Scroll down to our contact and contact your education team. The education team works for you and they'll be able to help you specifically. Eric, it's it's still black. What do you want to do? You want to pop out? Can, do you know how to get back in? Can you find that link as a presenter? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll pop out and then I'll just re reconnect to it. Yeah, maybe that'll work. I don't know. Let's try that. Okay. We can just keep, keep talking over here. <laughs> uh, Mohammed, just wondering if these slides will be available on the InterNACHI site for review. Uh, we'll ask Eric that question for sure. Maybe you can share them. Um, and then we'll put them up. And then you can email me later. Why don't you email me next week uh, sometime? Mohammed, uh, ben at internachi.org, ben at internachi.org. And then 
So let's see here. While Eric is getting that together, let's see what we got here. I want to show you one more thing. Oh, there he is. There you go. There's Eric. There we go. Now let's try this. And folks, we did practice this a couple times. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got it. Okay, is that the main screen or is that the one with the slides on the side? That's with the thumbnails on the slide on the side and you're okay. at the first slide. So you have to do a presentation and scroll all the way down wherever you were. Um, I think we were doing venting and uh, CAS and pressurizing, depressurizing the home. Those slides there. Perfect. Here we go. Thanks everyone for your patience. We do our best with this technology. There you go. I remember that one. All right. So we're on there now. Appreciate okay. It. So. Some of the common uh, vent pipe that you're going to be looking at um, when you're dealing with these 90 plus percent furnaces is the transition to the outside of the home. Um, very, very important that these two are not in direct contact with each other as far as the air combustion air intake and the exhaust outlet. So as you can see in this first diagram on the left, um, it talks about uh, or it shows a air intake pointing downward and then the exhaust vent going higher because those gases are, are going to be higher in temperature than, and also in pressure. So we want that vent to be higher than our combustion air intake area. Um, as long as we keep that in mind that the vent is going to always be higher than the exhaust that's going to prove or, or the air intake, then we want to not be able to pull those back in. To there. Let's see. Next screen. Hold on. Mine's showing something weird. There we go. All right. And then, of course, the one on the bottom is showing there is uh, opportunities where it can be a roof transition for the exhaust, and then possibly run a side for the air inlet, so that it kind of keeps the two separate, or vice versa, two parallel. Uh, running out two different areas of the home. This is just to give you guys some, some examples of it. When you're looking at centri uh, concentric termination kits, um, you'll see a single pipe coming out and it'll just look like a single pipe unless you know what you're kind of looking at. But uh, some, uh, the concentric type is a pipe within a pipe. So the outer pipe um, is your fresh air intake. And then the center pipe that runs straight through is the exhaust. So what'll happen is air will come behind this uh, kind of raised area and be pulled into that uh, outside pipe and go through that wall. And then it's got an area where it branches off and goes to the air intake. And then the exhaust is, is in the center of that piping. So you may come across some of this and go, wait a minute, why do I only have one pipe? Well, that's a concentric type uh, termination to allow, um, instead of having two holes go through, we're using just one single type of pipe and then we're still doing the same exact thing. And it keeps the flue gases and the air intake separate. Uh, some of the things to kind of pay, pay attention to, termination considerations. The exhaust fumes are near 100% relative humidity. That's why they condense. Um, and they'll also condense on nearby objects. They may drop kind of slow termination. That is slightly acidic as far as that gas or that uh, condensation, just because it does have a little bit of the other chemical makeup for byproducts. So it can be a little bit acidic. That part I kind of point out because certain local codes um, might dictate that if you have a uh, condensing furnace that they may not be able to in that area drain directly into a drain pipe um, into the sewer or septic systems. So that's just something to kind of kind of pay attention to when it comes to uh, 
90% plus condensing furnaces. And we also want to prevent against freezing because if it's really cold outside and I've got flue gases at 140 degrees and that water vapor starts to freeze up, it can actually clog that exhaust vent pipe. And I've got a picture on that a little bit here in a few. These are just different termination kits that you may come across. They work exactly like uh, the concentric in a way. They're just a different setup. Um, if, they, if you come across where you've got a, a furnace, a 90 percenter, and they're running that exhaust fumes down through a sublevel and then terminating out, let's say, a crawl space, there's some specifics that you want to kind of pay attention to when you're doing your home inspections. Uh, here's kind of this little drain pipe or T that kind of comes down. And if you notice, it doesn't go in the same line facing where those flue gases go through. It actually where the condensation will drain backwards um, into that. So as you can see in these pictures, how not to install them because these will not work properly if they're installed in that manner and can potentially cause uh, backup of flue gases and risk of carbon monoxide. Uh, some areas may have to have heaters because it does get so cold and we want to prevent that from freezing. So if you live in a high or a very, very cold temperature climate area uh, for most of the year, uh, you may come across where you see these cables. Or if you're doing your inspection in the middle of winter and you see that it's completely frozen because that condensation has frozen inside that vent pipe, then you might want to put a recommendation that they get a uh, heating system just for that pipe so that it doesn't freeze. You'll also see if, if it's not piped correctly or as it's coming down, you'll have it draining right off the end of that pipe. And these are all kind of bad things. These are these are things that should tell you that, hey, I need a, a, a heater on that pipe. So again, here's our terminations of two different pipes. This is going to be the most common because it's a lot easier for a lot of technicians. Uh, they're just going to come straight out, have a straight pipe and then your air intake. Here's the problem with that one. The problem is, is that the vent flute pipe is lower than my air intake, which means all it's gonna do is suck right back in there for a combustion air. And that's not what we want on these systems. Two pipes just coming out of the home, that's not good either. We need it to be set up in a way that we have our air intake separated from our flue gases, especially in a tight area like that, where you might get gusts of winds that might push that flue gas right back into the air intake for that system. You may come across something like this, or have already seen this, where people decide, hey, I'm gonna build a porch, and they just build it right through or around any of the type of heating or air conditioning type of equipment. Again, this would be a huge write-up and say, we can't run this furnace until this is this is fixed correctly by a professional. Another thing too, we know how important condensate drain traps are on air conditioning equipment, but they're also just as important on condensing uh, furnaces. Uh, good thing is most manufacturers provide a specific condensate drain trap for uh, flue gas condensation outside of furnaces. So as that pipe comes out of the furnace, it should drop right into this type of condensate drain trap before it goes out. If it's just a homemade, like a air conditioning type P trap, um, that's definitely not going to work. And that would be something I would definitely point out to the, the homeowner uh, for the furnace section of it. All right, this slide is application of various furnaces. This is just to kind of point out the different furnaces, burners that you're gonna actually run into. As you can see here, you got a pretty nice steady flame in this video and it's blue and it's doing what it's supposed to do. This is kind of what you're gonna be looking for when it comes to a flame um, inside of these furnaces. You want complete combustion. You want rapid carryover flame. That means when it ignites, it's gonna ignite each burner 
pretty quick and evenly. Uh, should be a fairly quiet operation. It should be like a very low rumble, just nice quiet. Like I said, if it's too high, then you've got some kind of combustion problems going on with that system and it definitely needs to be addressed. Um, should be immediate. Uh, I've seen some furnaces out there, you go to start and gas for some reason is building up in the combustion chamber. And when it goes to start, it makes a small uh, explosion. Uh, again, that would be something that I would note as a problem and they would need somebody to, to come out and check and see what's going on with that flame. And you want definitely uniform heating and stable flame performance. The classifications we classify as far as burner classifications, you have your natural drafts, your fan assist, and your force draft. So a natural draft is like we were talking about with the really old 60, 70% type furnaces, where it just allows uh, air in the CAS area to mix with the exhaust fumes to go outside the home. Fan assisted, that's your uh, regular intermediate type um, draft inducer fans. And then your force draft is what you're going to see on your 90%. It's going to create that positive pressure on the force draft burners. And then your burners, atmospheric burners, pre-mixers, or nozzle mixing. This is just to show you that there's just different types of burner classifications, different burner ports. They've changed over the years. Some manu most manufacturers today use the in-shot burner, and that's kind of what we saw in this uh, diagram here. These are the in-shot uh, style burners on newer equipment. Old styles you're going to run into may look um, where it's got multiple different ports. Um, and then just has just a different, it's just a different setup all the way around. This is what I was kind of talking about with the burner classifications when we were talking about the oil fired. Um, here you have an open combustion chamber where it's just a solid, looks like a barrel or a tank. And then it just blows flames in it. Your air, uh, so your return air blows across that heat exchanger, picks up that heat, and then that heat just goes straight out the flue. This is pretty inefficient because you don't have the multiple loops to get as much out of that uh, flue gas and that flame as possible. Whereas here you see the different loop type systems before it actually goes out. Again, this would be a forced draft and this one's forced actually by the uh, fan motor that's built onto that burner for that gun type burner assembly. So we have different types of uh, burners that you'll see out there. Again, these are mostly the old style that you'll see. You've got a slotted type where each slot almost looks like a gas grill. Uh, they, there, you'll still see those furnaces out there. You have these ribbon types. That's where you have an independent flame that just kind of burns all the way across. Looks like small candles. This is a like an initial type of an in shot where it just kind of almost looks like a turbo torch type tip that blows the flame right into the combustion chamber. And then your most modern in-shot burner types is what you're typically gonna see nowadays on burners. Along with burners, ignition systems are gonna be different depending on what we're looking at um, and what kind of system it is and how old that system is. Um, you have these different types, like especially Standing pilots. Standing pilot system just has an additional line off the gas valve that supplies gas to a, a port that typically has a flame burning on it at all times. It's just a small little flame and when they get that call for uh, heat, it uses that flame to ignite those burner ports when there's a call. Again, you won't see these except for on older equipment or water heater type systems. You also have the uh, manual ignition where it will light a pilot, uh, but it's not a standing pilot. So usually by a direct spark ignition with some type of hood or head on it to kind of protect that flame from blowing out. Here's a here's an example of one uh, intermittent or interrupted ignition system. So the spark hits and sparks to this casing that's right above it. 
you got a little bit of gas coming out of this uh, pilot port. It lights that pilot, that pilot lights, that lights the burners. And that's how uh, those type of systems will work. And those are those are pretty common. Those are still out there that you'll see on older equipment. Then you have also your direct spark, uh, kind of the hose and the whole contraption of what it looks like. And these are the ones that usually make the loudest noise when they go to ignite because it's that high spark. These usually run about anywhere from 7,000 to 14,000 volts. So they're very, very powerful. You really don't wanna to be uh, touching the cabinet when these systems are, are lighting off just in case there is an internal problem. Uh, because if it does short out, that voltage will light up that cabinet. And if you're touching it, then it's gonna go through you. Um, other types of direct spark ignitions, these don't make as much noise. These just kind of make these small little uh, arcs between these two connectors. And that lights that gas air mixture as it goes through the combustion chamber for ignition. These are the more modern. This is what you're gonna see in the newer type of equipment, hot surface igniters. The one on the top, that was the first style of hot surface igniters. Uh, they glow similar to like a stove. Um, it's a kind of porous material, very, very delicate. They can break very easily. Um, hand prints on technicians. I tell technicians all the time, don't ever touch that material on the uh, ignition hot surface igniter because the oil from the fingers will actually cause it not to get hot in the areas where that fingerprint is. They've been having problems with these breaking quite frequently. So the manufacturers have came out with this newer style, um, nitride uh, igniter, hot surface igniter. And these are almost indestructible. We've actually ran tests where we've driven these into two by fours, supplied power to it, and caught the, the board on fire multiple times using the same one. So they are very, very much more efficient. And, and these are on a lot of the newer, I would say over the last five years type of ignitions that you'll see out there. Again, this just kind of goes um, in, we talked about the sequence of operation. Once we have our flame, we have to have something that can sense that flame and send a signal back to the board. It just basically proves that there is a flame. It tells the system, hey, I've ignited the gas and everything is operating properly and I do have a flame and it will send that signal back to that board. Oil type uh, burners will usually use a optical flame sensor. What it does is it kind of looks at the flame in a uh, different way using like an infrared and it just basically proves that there is light and that there is a flame and sends that signal back to the board. Typically you'll see these on any kind of uh, uh, oil fired uh, burners. Any questions on gas furnaces or any type of furnace uh, appliance? We do have a couple questions. There was one by William. Does the condensate actually damage a septic system? So it doesn't really damage it. Um, it's just it's just going to be slightly acidic um, compared to normal condensation from an air conditioning coil. Uh, and some codes, depending on where you live in the country, may have some regulations on it. I can tell you from the manufacturer standpoint, uh, they're going to tell all their technicians, you know, hey, just run it, but also just be cognitive of uh, the septic system codes of wherever they're. Uh, installing that piece of equipment. But as far as hurting it, no, it's it's yeah. not going to do any kind of damage to it. Matthew asks, do concentric pipes create more condensation due to cooler air shrouding the exhaust pipe? Um, it does cool it down a little bit more. So let's say I've got, let's say it's zero degrees outside, we're up north, we're running this furnace. Um, you are going to get a little bit of that heat transfer through that uh, that PVC piping, and it is going to cool down those flue gases uh, quite considerably, but it shouldn't cool it down to where it's going to freeze within the pipe. It's usually going to be where the flue gases actually come out when it hits that super cold air. Um, that's where you're going to get the most of your additional condensation and frost and ice buildup. Uh, William asks, can rubber 
couplings be used to connect C PVC pipes, I guess on a cat four, like those, like a rubber fern cos instead of glue, instead of gluing the pipe connections. Um, it should be able to, because your temperatures aren't that high. Um, as long as it's an approved sealant um, to be able to seal those. And again, that would probably have to come back from the manufacturer code or any of the gas categories, um, what they recommend for using to seal those. Uh, uh, um, I, I wouldn't see a problem with it just because it's not that high of a temperature. That's all the questions we got. All right, perfect. All right, our last section that we're going to be talking about today is going to be the air conditioning systems. All right, a couple, couple types and configurations that you'll run into out there. Um, we have the package units, which is down here on the bottom. That's where everything is built into one system, and then it's just ducted in externally into a home. You have your split systems, which are typically your most common that you're going to run into. And it can be a split system between an outdoor unit and an indoor air handler, or an outdoor unit with a furnace with a indoor coil uh, to make up the other side of that air conditioning system. All right, so let's kind of get into air conditioners. How does an air conditioner work? There's six main components that you have to have for an AC system to work properly. And I'll kind of go through these fairly quickly. Um, your compressor, a condenser, a metering device, evaporator, condenser fan, and indoor blower. All we're doing in AC world is transferring heat. That's the whole purpose for everything that we do in when it comes to refrigeration appliances. We just want to move heat. Uh, compressor is basically going to be your heart of your system. It's the one that takes a low pressure, low temperature gas vapor, refrigerant vapor, and it's going to compress that vapor to a high pressure, high temperature uh, vapor. And kind of gives here as a diagram as that refrigerant comes into it and then as it discharges from the compressor. Once there, it's going to go through the condenser coils um, as a high temperature, um, high pressure refrigerant vapor and as it goes through we have a fan motor directly on top of that condenser that's going to draw air through the sides and then up out the top of the condenser and as it does that it cools that refrigerant down and as it cools it will condense the refrigerant into a liquid once we have it condensed down to a liquid we want to continue it through the the uh the piping system and we want to go to our metering device. Now, a metering device, we want that refrigerant to be as much liquid as possible before it gets uh, to the metering device. Uh, we kind of talked about the fan already. Um, so as liquid comes in on this metering device, only thing it does is it has a small port that allows that refrigerant to go through. And once it comes through the other side, it goes from a small diameter area to a larger diameter area. And that increase in area causes the pressure to drop and the temperature to drop pretty much instantaneously. It's just the properties of the refrigeration and how it circulates through a system. So now we've got low pressure, low temperature liquid going to our next component, which is our evaporator coil. As this liquid refrigerant goes through this coil, air from your blower motor is drawn across that coil causing the uh, liquid to actually pick up heat from the house and it boils off that refrigerant, a liquid refrigerant, into a vapor refrigerant. Once it leaves there, it leaves out as a low pressure, low temperature vapor. And again, there's your blower motor that blows across that coil. That's why if you ever see a frozen coil, typically it's because of low or no airflow. I lose airflow across that coil, it's going to eventually freeze up that coil. And then it's just gonna cycle back down to my compressor and it just, it's almost like a lazy river. It just cycles through that refrigerant through that, that entire process. Um, some of the things you wanna kind of look for in these refrigerant uh, systems is anywhere there's a joint where it's been soldered together, making sure that you don't see any oil. Signs of oil typically means that there's a leak. 
Plus, when you do your temperature check AC system, it's not going to really be blowing that well. Uh, you're not going to get that cold air or a temperature difference um, if the refrigerant has leaked out. Also, as you notice in this picture, you have a filter dryer. Um, most manufacturers today actually install a filter dryer within the condenser system itself. Um, if you ever come to one of those systems and you look inside with the fan not running and you see a filter and then you look on the outside of the line set and there's another filter, uh, more filters is not a good thing. That would be something that I would definitely annotate is that there's two filters on that system when there should only be one. Um, the suction line, the cold line or the bigger line uh, does get cold. And so it has to be insulated uh, for many different purposes. One, you want to make sure that you keep that refrigerant as cold as possible and it's not picking up too much heat from the outside area or the run through the home. And that filter, that's a, a, one of those components that you can like uh, cheat and take a look at. It'll have an arrow on it. And if it has two arrows going in an opposite direction, it's a heat pump. Is that right? That is, yes. That is absolutely correct. Um, you'll, you'll, I, I've seen all kinds of different things out there <laughs> that's, that's just wrong. Um, if it's a heat pump system, you want to definitely make sure that it is the one with the two arrows. If it is a single system, just a straight cool AC, um, it needs to be a filter with the one directional arrow only. It does not need to be a two uh, byway arrow and there's a lot of contractors that'll put the by the the two flow in whether it's a heat pump or an ac system and it should just be one direction for straight ac two direction for heat pump and i've seen it on heat pump where they put the one directionals in that creates a restriction and causes all kinds of problems as well okay. um there, the suction line filter, that's a bigger filter. And what these are designed for, they're not designed to be in the system um, all the time. What happens is, is, let's say a compressor burns out and you have acid that builds up in the system due to that burnout. You put these in to get all that acid out of there after you change out that compressor. Once you've ran it for so many so much time, you go and you pull this out of the system, you put another filter in there, and then you keep doing that until uh, usually about two or three times. So if you come to a home and you see a line a filter on the big line set that that needs to be taken out of the system. They're not designed to be in there long term. They're just to remove uh, acid from a burnout of the system. So just some of, the, some of the notes you can kind of um, look for when you guys are doing home inspections. This one question, uh, yes. RPUs. Paul asks, is the metering device the same as that thermo expansion valve? It is, it is. Um, the thermo expansion valve, it operates, it modulates uh, based on the temperature of the refrigerant coming out of the evaporator coil. Um, it'll either say, hey, I'm too warm and I need to open up and let more liquid in, or it'll say, hey, I'm too cold, I need to shut down a little bit, and uh, it just meters that refrigerant in. Um, some can be fixed metering devices, some can be TXVs. So it just really depends on the system setup and what that manufacturer installed on that equipment. Okay, thanks. Okay. And again, a package unit, all the same uh, refrigerant cycle and components are all in one cabinet. So here, now that we kind of looked at the, the sequence of how everything flows together, um, on the left side, you have your either air handler with your coil or your furnace with your coil. Return air comes in through that uh, uh, component and blows across that evaporator coil heat transfers that hot heat goes into that liquid refrigerant boiling it off at the same time it cools down that air and that's how we get cool air supplied to the home outdoor does the exact opposite external air is pulled across uh, the coil the condenser coil by the fan blades and pulled up uh, through as it also gives up its heat uh, to the refrigerant condensing it or cools the refrigerant down 
um, electric heat strips. Uh, one of the so if you've got a heat pump system or even a straight cool system with an air handler, you may have you may see some where they'll have external uh, heat strips in there as auxiliary heat. Now these play a huge factor uh, for heat pump systems specifically because a heat pump goes into what they call a defrost mode. Um, and, and so we've kind of seen a straight cool AC cycle of refrigeration. We see that the outdoor coil gets hot, the indoor coil gets cold. On a heat pump, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a valve, which we'll see here in a second, and it reverses the flow of refrigerant. It sends that hot refrigerant to the indoor coil, um, and then it sends the cooler refrigerant to the outdoor coil. So if it's zero degrees outside and I'm sending already cold refrigerant to that outdoor coil, it's going to get a chance to freeze up. And it, there are safeties and defrost control boards that will make it go into normal AC mode to heat up that frost so it doesn't frost and stays efficient. But when it does that, you in essence turn that heat pump back into a straight AC and now you're blowing cold air into that home. So uh, one of the things I always look for with a heat pump system is to make sure that they did install heat strips um, because if they didn't, when it goes into that defrost mode, you're just blowing cold air into that homeowner's house. Again, here's that reversing valve. Typically to find out if it's a heat pump, a quick easy look, look down uh, below the flan, uh, fan blades on the condenser, you should see this device. And what that is, that tells me right away, this is a heat pump system. So that's going to be one of your easiest ways to tell. The other is to uh, look up the model number and see, and typically it'll tell you online if it's a straight cool or a heat pump. But this is the easiest visual way to, to see the difference. Again, here's just the same same refrigerant cycle. The one on the left is what we were seeing in straight AC. Your indoor coil is the evaporator. Your outdoor coil is the condenser. When I go over on the right side to heat mode, that reversing valve slides over and it just redirects the direction of that refrigerant. So now my hot refrigerant is going to my indoor coil and my cold refrigerant is going to the outdoor coil. It's doing the exact same thing with the airflow. We're still transferring heat uh, across both coils to either make it absorb heat or remove heat from that refrigerant. Here's a picture of a uh, heat pump that had been operating and did not go into defrost mode and ends up uh, frosting or freezing over. If you come across something like this, definitely write that up, annotate it that, hey, the, the heat pump system is not going into defrost mode because that's something that definitely needs to be checked out by a technician. Now we're going to look at, since we saw how it operates from a mechanical standpoint, from the user standpoint, how an air conditioner works. Again, we have power going to the indoor unit that's to power our indoor blower fan the outdoor disconnect going to run through a set of contacts that's going to power my compressor and my outdoor condenser fan and the transformer is always going to be on the inside unit um, unless it's a package unit then it'll be in the package unit control section but that transformer sends your 24 volts to your thermostat once you put it in whichever mode that you're using, in this instance, it's cool mode, it's going to send a signal to my contactor, pulling in that contactor, supplying power to both outdoor fan and compressor simultaneously. At that same time, it's going to send a signal for my blower fan to kick on in my either furnace or air handler. And so that way I have all my components operating simultaneously. On air conditioners, the sequence is they all are going to run at the same time, unlike the furnace where it sequences it. So now we look at a heat pump. The only difference here is um, in, let's see, so this is in heat mode. Typically, the reversing valve is the only thing we've added to this. 
If I go and I say, okay, I want heat, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send a signal to that reversing valve. It's gonna slide over. It's gonna send that hot refrigerant into my indoor unit. The cooler refrigerant is gonna go outside and I'm gonna be able to supply heat using the refrigerant um, of that system throughout my home. And if I, and then in cool mode, only difference is, is I'm just gonna have no uh, power going to that reversing valve for my thermostat. So then it operates in normal air conditioning mode. Um, so we've kind of looked at this from two different perspectives on AC systems. So we have straight AC, usually with a gas furnace, or you could have an air handler with electric heat strips. Um, most common, I believe, is going to be just the furnace with a coil uh, with an AC condenser. Then your heat pump system are typically going to be mounted with a uh, air handler and also with the auxiliary heat strips. So kind of reviewing kind of what we went over today, we kind of explained the furnace sequence of operation, how that operates, identifying different categories of gas furnaces. And also we described the AC and heat pump operations of these systems. Um, again, this was a this is a big overview uh, to not get into far as the technicalities from a technician standpoint, but a better understanding of how these systems actually do operate and kind of what we're looking for as as home inspectors when we go out on these calls. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Ben. Hey, thanks, Eric. That was really good. I really like that. And it's really important for home inspectors to understand the, especially the, the cycles of the furnace and the air conditioner and the heat pump and how it works, because we're essentially educating our clients, our homeowners. And one of the things we want to do really well is to communicate how the freaking thing works, right? And if we don't know, then we can't communicate that. So having the basics, uh, even for uh, veteran certified master inspectors, is really good. Uh, I really appreciate your work in doing that. We do have some questions if, if you have any time. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Paul asks, why are furnace and water heater flue pipes oriented to the chimney based on the BTU, ra BTU ratings of the units being serviced with the highest BTU pipe at the bottom? What happens if they're reversed? So when two, like the water heaters and the furnace come in and they uh, Y up, vertically into the chimney stack. Why is the why is one on the bottom and the other one on top? How do they orient? So as far as that that goes, and I and I have seen them out there like that. Um, I I honestly don't know the specifics as to why as far as the BTU ratings um, and those flue pipes. And typically you'll see those on the the either 80% furnace matched up to um, a natural draft or a uh, induced draft type water heater. Um, but because they both do have the inducer fan motors, um, I, as far as that specific configuration, I, I don't have the answer directly on that, um, how those tie in. Um, and it's always the manufacturing recommendations, you know, so yes. I was talking about that before, you know, sometimes I'll just pull it out and see if I can quickly figure out what it's going <laughs> on or, or not. But um, I always say, uh, as a home inspector, like, if I don't know, I'll just say, I don't know, but I'm going to get you the answer. So you can always do a picture of it and do a little research and then find somebody who knows the answer and get back to me. Yep. Um, so good question, Paul. Lori asks, if I'm inspecting a heat pump, how long should I wait before switching from heat to cool or vice versa? Awesome question. So nowadays with systems, what will happen is you can switch it uh, automatically. The technology built into heat pumps now, they have a five minute compressor uh, lockout. So you can't damage the equipment. If you go over there and switch it, it's going to stay off for about five minutes before it kicks on. If it is kicking over immediately, once you change it from heating to cooling, then that would also be annotated as something that needs to be checked out by a technician. Uh... Paul asks, how can you determine if a metering device is bad or in need of replacement? What normally happen, happens? So that gets a little bit more into the technical aspects, but uh, metering devices can either fail shut or they can fail full open. Um, 
inspecting a system without gauges and trying to figure out exactly what's going on, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult, uh, but easy for a technician. But the, in essence, the biggest problems are you either starve the evaporator, which means now you're not really cooling the house. So that's going to be one indication. The other indication is you flood the compressor. You're sending too much liquid back to that compressor and over time it is going to damage it. One indication that you can kind of speculate that from an external standpoint standing outside the unit is if that compressor is making a horrible noise. Uh, compressors do not compress liquid and when it tries to it, it messes them up. So that would be the biggest indications that you might have a problem with the external or the TXV. Um, let's see. Home inspectors, there's one uh, called Micro, operates AC units in the dead of winter without knowing if there's a sump heater or pump heater. What's your opinion and what at temperatures do you not operate them? We talked about this before. What about turning on an air conditioner in a cold climate in the winter? It's not going to hurt it. Um, liquid refrigerant, and we, we probably all heard it, and that's, I think this is where this comes from, is that oil inside a refrigeration system will migrate to the coldest place. Your evaporator coil on a straight AC is typically your coldest area, so oil does migrate from the compressor through the system and into the evaporator coil. Um, with that said, operating it on the outside, if I can operate it at zero degrees, and that's if it's warm enough inside to actually get a call for cooling, um, then I'm making the outside a little bit cooler. And again, that's just going to cause that uh, oil to migrate back to the compressor where it should be in the first place. So it's not going to damage it or hurt that equipment. Eric, I really appreciate it. I mean, I really do. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, um, I know it's going to be very valuable for our international members and home inspectors. I really appreciate your time and prepping the slides for us and uh, taking a Saturday morning to uh, be with us today. Oh, absolutely, Ben. And I, I greatly appreciate you uh, having me on here. I love what I do as far as teaching this. That's wonderful. Thank you so much again, sir. And I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for attending and watching the video. If you're watching it now, feel free to reach out to Nachi. Uh, um, at natchi.org slash contact. We're all on the contact page. And um, Eric, one more question. What about the slides? Folks are asking about the slides. Do you want to make them available? Is that possible? Yeah, we, we can definitely do that. Um, if you want, what I'll do is I can get those over to you and then you can be able to post them and make them available for everyone. Fantastic. Will you come back sometime? Oh, absolutely. Just, just let me know when. <laughs> all right, buddy. Thank you so much. Stay safe and healthy, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye.